So my name is Glenn Sweeney. I work in the Bay Area. I work for a well-known fruit company. We manufacture fruit. Um, and that's <laughs> all we're going to say about that. So um, by day, I'm an imaging scientist. I, I model optics. Um, by night and by my thesis and undergrad work, I'm a color scientist. And so, of course, I'm going to talk to you about color tonight. And I hope that's not completely boring for all of you. So how many of you know what color is? Anyone? Hands. I see some hands. Color is what? R, G, and B, 0 to 255. Perfect. OK. My job here is done. OK. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about R, G, and B tonight. I hope that's OK. Uh, we're going to talk about some things. Well, eventually, we'll get to some other fun letters like X, Y, and Z. Has anyone heard of those letters before? A couple hands. Two, three, three, four hands. OK, great. We are going to go back to before there were computers and before we had any way to talk about color at all. And we're going to look at how the very, very early scientists back in the 1930s studying color uh, actually came up with their first computational models to describe color. Um, there are a few things that I hope you know. And if you don't know, I'm just going to tell you right now, and then we can move on. So that's fine. Maybe high school physics, something about electromagnetic radiation. Light is made up of a whole bunch of different wavelengths. And most of the light sources we deal with day to day uh, have a whole bunch of different wavelengths in them. We generally don't deal with monochromatic light sources. Um, though for the rest of this talk, we are going to deal with monochromatic light sources. So I'm also going to assume you know, or I'm telling you right now, that light is linear. If I have two light sources and I shine them together, their spectra, or these, these plots of their wavelengths, will add together. And there's nothing else that happens. It's just simply additive. The last thing is a tiny, tiny bit about human physiology. I hope that all of you can at least see some color. Do we have any deuteranopes in the audience, people who are red-green colorblind? No. Wow. That is exceptional. Um, about 1 in 12 men are deuteranopes, or red-green colorblind, and about 1 in 30,000 people can't see any color at all. So. It's good that all of you know a little bit about color, because you can see it day to day. So a little tiny bit more about the human visual system. This is really important, because it sort of underpins the rest of what we're going to go through. Um, the eye, the human eye, has four different, well, three, we're going to talk about three of them, different color detectors in the eye. And we call these S, M, and L cones, or short, medium, and long cones. Cones is simply the shape of them. They're, they're sort of funny cone-shaped detectors back there that can pick up different wavelengths of lights. You also have these things called rods, which is what gives you night vision. But rods really suck, and so we try not to deal with them as much as we can in color. Um, humans don't see spectra. As I said, you have these short, medium, and long cones. The, they're sort of drawn on here, blue, green, and red. Though that's always a misnomer. They don't really see red, green, and blue color, especially you can see how close together M and L are. But what we see is the integrated response of these channels against any light source. So you remember we had these nice light sources. When you look at a color, you don't see that. You can't tell me, oh, there's this much of 430 nanometers in that. You tell me it looks kind of blue. And the reason is you only get these three channels. There's only three inputs to the human color vision system. And that's sort of the underpinning to all of our understanding of color, because I think all of you know we use three dimensions to talk about color, red, green, blue, x, y, z, Y, C, B, C, R. I mean, any color space that you deal with, almost any color space that you, you deal with, is fundamentally three-dimensional, and this is why. So um, to go back to the very beginning of time, anyone heard of Munsell before? Couple hands, great. Uh, Albert Munsell was a painter. In fact, the, the first color scientist was a painter. And he was a color scientist who, or a painter, who was unhappy with the state of painting. He wanted to be able to go to his student and say, oh, not just, oh, your, your paint is a little bit too red. He wanted to be, si be able to say, go get this paint. Go get a paint of exactly this hue saturation chroma, hue lightness chroma. You've heard all of these words before. And so what he did, and unfortunately I don't have a picture because there aren't any I could find in the public domain, but he built a book of color. I sort of have a 3D representation, but he actually made this solid out of piece pieces of paper that he painted. And he painstakingly, by eye, made a uniform color space. Each tile in this space is perceptually an equal step away from each other tile. And he gave each one a name. He had a 
axis for lightness, an axis for chroma, and an axis for hue. And so he could go to a student and say, you need this paint. And that was really the beginning of color as we know it. Um, after he did that, a whole bunch of different people started building color systems. And more and more and more of these color systems sort of grew out of the weeds as people wanted to be able to communicate color to each other without just shipping paint back and forth. This was still perceptual. We had one guy, Albert Munsell, who spent four and a half years of his life under a whole bunch of tungsten lights trying to mix these colors and these paints. And ultimately, for science or measurement or engineering, one observer making one set of measurements is not exactly great. And so we needed a standardized way to be able to measure color and measure a human's perception to color. Nowadays, it's actually pretty easy. You find a willing subject, you go in and you biopsy their retina, you pull a piece of their retina out, you stick it under a microscope, you shine a whole bunch of different color lights through it, and you can directly measure, actually, the human sensitivity to color. That's how we've solved the problem in modern science. But back in 1930, they weren't biopsying, people, biopsying people's retinas. They didn't have the technology, actually, to measure the transmittance of individual cones in a retina. These things are, are single cells that you're trying to measure. And so we needed indirect ways to do that. And it all comes down to this idea of a color-matching experiment. We want to set up an experiment that lets us measure a human's response to color. The goal of this is to be able to come up with an indirect way to measure how a human sees color. And remember, we, we talked way back when, on the left of the slide, I have this sort of curly U curl. That's my representation of a light spectrum. And again, you can't see the spectrum. You just see some color. And under regular conditions, that spectrum could look sort of like this pink-ish color on the slide. Well, going from spectra to perception is really hard, but we're just going to sort of gloss over that. Um, but as I said, you can't see a spectrum. All you can see is some amount of red, green, and blue, or this short, medium, and long wavelength. Unfortunately, as you remember, those medium and those long wavelength spectra were right on top of each other. And so we can't individually stimulate them. I can't have one light source and change the amount of S you see, and one light source and change the amount of M you see, and one light source that changed the amount of L. But we can get pretty close. And so back in 1930s, actually this was 1928 at the time, um, scientists produced some of these monochromatic lights that we can start mixing together to see how people see them. Um, and they chose some very interesting spectra. I, I actually put the numbers up here. Um, I don't know if any of you have the lines of uh, helium lights and hydrogen lights memorized, uh, but these are actually spectral lines out of noble gases being excited with electricity. And so that was sort of the first technology we had to produce monochromatic lights. Uh, we didn't have lasers. This is back in the 30s. Lasers were 1963-ish. Um, and so we really took these lights and we just filtered them down and pulled out these spectral emissions. Uh, you see, 700 didn't work so well. There is no nice emission line in gases out there. And so what they did was they took a really bright tungsten light and they filtered it way off and they tried to cut off as much of it as they could. And so what we can do is we can have an observer look at my funny, you're probably wondering what the hell this thing is in the middle. We call this a bipartite field. You can imagine this is a tube, an observer looks down with one eye, and on the left-hand side, we put a source spectrum, and then we ask them to mix on the other side these three different lights, 400 nanometer, 500 nanometer, and 700 nanometer light. And they can go back and forth, and they can mix this red, this green, and this blue, and we call these primaries to try and create the same appearance as a spectrum on the left. And it turns out, when you do this and you have an observer go and twiddle these knobs, you end up with some unequal mixture of red, green, and blue. So we can take these colors, mix them together on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, you can match visually these two spectra. Now, remember, they're very, very different spectra. The one on the left and the one on the, on the right look nothing alike if we were to measure them. But to the human eye, we're exciting that L cone, that M cone, and that S cone to exactly the same degree. And so to us, they are visually identical. So that's a whole lot of experimental setup, right? We have to build this bipartite field. We have to put a spectrum on the left side. We need to get these three monochromatic sources and put them on the right side. We need to get an observer to look at it. The observer needs to twiddle all these knobs. The observer is getting tired, staring with one eye at these very dim lights. It sucks. And it sucked back then, and it still sucks today when we run these experiments. But at the time, this was the only way that scientists could get at this information. This was, in fact, the very, very first experiment ever done in measuring 
the human response to color. Now, we still have no idea about these S, M, and L cones. We don't know the, the shapes of those, those curves back in 1930. But we can derive a little bit of information from this. Now, instead of putting a polychromatic spectrum, one of those nice curves, what if I put a single wavelength on the left? Now I can have my observer stare down the pipe and mix red, green, and blue until it looks just like this monochromatic spectrum, except your observer is going to sit there for hours and hours and hours, and there is no mixture of these three red, green, and blue colors that give the same perception of this other monochromatic light. Scientists were undeterred, and they said, oh, let's just add some negative light. Everyone's fine with negative light, right? Right? Good. Okay. Um, way back a couple minutes ago, I talked about how light is additive. Well, because of that phenomenon, we're going to cheat. And on the left-hand side, where that monochromatic spectrum was, instead of subtracting off more and more and more red light, we're already at zero. We can't take away more red. We're going to add red light to the other side. And so now I can sort of simulate negative light in this experiment. And so I can have some green, some blue, and a little bit of negative red. And I can simulate that the, er and the observer can get these two sides to match perfectly. And once I do that, I can actually have some amount of this red primary, this green primary, and this blue primary that looks like this spectrum. You guys are all video people, right? Gamut clipping? You can't have negative numbers in your gamut, right? This is sort of that, that problem. You, if you have this monochromatic spectrum and you imaged it and you're trying to display it on a screen, there is no combination of red, green, and blue on your monitor because you have these limited primaries. In fact, yours sort of suck more. Most of you are dealing with polychromatic primaries, which makes the problem a lot harder. Um, but in these experiments where we have observers sort of bolted down into chairs and things like that, it's pretty easy to add this light on the other side to simulate it. So we're going to recap for a second. We had a spectrum. We had an observer match that. We put a monochromatic spectrum there. We can even have, it have an observer match that. But we haven't really made it anywhere, right? We can say that these two colors are the same, but we don't know anything about perception. Except we sort of know everything already, right? I can say, if I want to produce this monochromatic spectrum, I know how much of this other red light, this other green light, and this other blue light, I need to make that happen. And I can do the same thing with, with really any monochromatic spectrum. You guys see where this is going? And so I can do this again and again and again and again with my observer every single monochromatic spectrum that I care about, and I can measure an entire set of functions. And now I have an indirect model of the human eye. I know with the primaries I selected, which was the special red, the special green, and the special blue light, how much of those I need to make any monochromatic spectrum. This is 1931. How many people do you think they did this with? I mean, this is the underpinning of all of our modern color science. It must be this huge group of 13 white 40-year-old males. Um, it's this fantastically small data set that this was based off of. And so a very, very small number of people went through this. In fact, 13 people were not measured in the same lab. There were two different labs uh, halfway across Europe that were doing this. Um, and they got several observers in each lab, different experimental setups. There was nothing really controlled about this. And they went and they measured these red, green, and blue response functions here for 13 white 40-year-old male observers. And in fact, today, if any of you have heard of the CIE 1931 color space that we all use, maybe you've seen that b somewhere before, that's still based off of these 13 guys. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. What's the big deal? We can talk now, we can look at a monochromatic spectrum, and I can say how much of this red, this green, and this blue light I need to match that spectrum. But what about my polychromatic spectrum? I don't want to have to take every possible spectrum and stick an observer, turn on this tube, have them look at it, they get tired. I mean, this is horrible. And so I'm not going to do that for an, infinite, for an infinite number of spectra. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, go back to my first slide and remember, hey, any polychromatic spectrum is really just the sum of a whole bunch of monochromatic spectra. Now what I can do is I can say, I know how much I need for this monochromatic spectrum and how much I need for that monochromatic spectrum, and I can just start to sum up a response for the entire light. And in fact, it looks like this. Uh, I hope you guys can see that. I've sort of overlaid those red, green, and blue functions with my quasi 
monochromatic broken up spectrum. And you can actually just read off. I need, OK, for the first wavelength, and I need really nothing. For that third wavelength, I need a lot of blue, a little bit of negative red, a little bit of green. And you can see how you can just sort of stack these all end on end and sum that all up. And at the end, I know how much of this red, how much of this green, and how much of this blue I need. Now, all of you were really excited. We finally got to RGB. Unfortunately, this actually isn't what you guys know as sRGB. Uh, this was a completely different RGB color space. We have a lot of those. Um, that was derived, again, 1930s. And this was just used as the first experimental data set. There were a lot of problems with this. The biggest problem was that, as we just talked about, there are negative numbers. And we're all fine with negative numbers here, but in 1931, you know how they were adding all of this together? I had some poor guy in front of a mechanical adding machine who was typing in all of these numbers one by one and running it through a, mechan a mechanical adder. And color science labs are not rich. And so buying a mechanical adder that can add negative numbers is significantly more expensive than a mechanical adder that can only add positive numbers. And so therein lies the problem, and that is the reason that we don't know R bar, G bar, and B bar today, but we know X bar, Y bar, and Z bar. So scientists said, we have this problem. We can't add negative numbers. We're going to have to do it by hand. This is horrible. So we're going to recompute a different color space based off of our experimental results, where everything is perfect and everything is positive. And that, my friends, is where XYZ came from. It was scientists being cheap and lazy working from their experimental data uh, that they collected in a lab and transforming it into something that was usable on their mechanical adders so they didn't have to sit in the lab late at night adding numbers by hand. Um, there are some other nice properties uh, that were derived in doing that, and I'm not going to go through the math of how they went from this RGB to this XYZ space, but um, one of the advantages was this new green function, or the Y function that they derived, happens to pretty closely match the human visual response to lightness, or our perception of how light things are. So it sort of gives us this nice, more orthogonal space where one axis is how light things are, and the other two sort of, kind of, encode color. Um, it's not nearly that pretty in XYZ, but uh, that was sort of their intent at the time. From this, we came up with a postulate, right? Way back here, we said, I can take a spectrum, I can have an observer look at it, I can figure out how much of this red, green, blue I need to make it look the same. And so now I know any color for which, sorry, I compute this red, green, and blue, or by extension, this X, Y, and Z. And we're going to talk a little bit more about X, Y, Z in a second. Any light that I compute the same number for must look the same to a human observer, with a few caveats. Remember, it's to this pool of average 13, 40-year-old white male observers, only in the center two degrees of the field of view of the human eye, with exactly the same sample surface properties, with the same background, exactly the same observer adaptation and light sources. You actually can't run this experiment and shine those lights continuously. You have to flash them, because otherwise the eye adapts to them differently. I mean, the list of caveats on this go on and on and on. But this was the first model where we were actually able to, in a lab, hook up a device, measure the spectrum from a light source, and find out if a human would perceive it as the same as a completely different spectrum or not. And that was, in fact, the first time we could ever measure the human response to color. Note that I don't say human perception of color. We still can't really accurately measure that. But we could at least say, this is the same as this other color to a human. So there we are. We've gone from an experiment where we're trying to say, how can we measure color, all the way up to where we are right now, where we have this thing called XYZ. This is 1931. So since 1931, we've done a ton of work, and we've come up with things much better than XYZ, right? Uh, unfortunately not. This is still where we are today. This XYZ is sort of the fundamental underpinning of all of our modern color. Your sRGB, your LAB, any color space you've ever touched, even on your monitor, the RGB values that we're displaying, all of this is still underpinned by the CIE XYZ. And so the moral of that story is, is color as we know it is for 40-year-old white men. Um, 
I'm not going to harp on that too much more, I promise. <laughs> it just, just really bothers me. In 1964, they tried again. Um, they brought a whole bunch more observers in. They set up more experiments. They, they really tried hard. And they came up with a new color space, and no one really adopted it because people were used to using 1931. They said, I'm getting results that make sense. Why should I change? And so it sits around, and there's this great data set that nobody uses. Um, individu individual variation is actually fairly significant. Um, for instance, uh, men in particular have a lot of color variation because there's a few genes carried on the X chromosome that we only get one of. Um, and so we have quite a lot of variation in that L cone. There's actually seven different genes that control the spectral shift of that L cone relative to that M cone. And so for some men who have worse color genes, they'll be very, very close, and they see these longer wavelengths very, very differently than men who have different color genes, and those two cones are, are quite separate. Um, in reality, normally these differences are sort of hidden under measurement noise on, in standard lab conditions. Um, but as we move further and further into newer technologies, laser projectors are a huge issue. Whereas before we had in your monitor these nice LED-based fil filtered primaries, now we have these nice monochromatic, crisp, clear, beautiful primaries, and now the observer-to-observer -observer variations are just amplified tenfold. Um, humans looking at laser projectors see very, very different colors than each other, whereas on uh, your standard LCD displays, the variations are very small. So this is actually coming back into the forefront today, is my answer to that. And so hopefully we'll see some, some good research driving that in the future. So we came up with this way of measuring a color. If we know that spectral shape of a color, we can get these XYZ values. And if we get the same XYZ values for two different colors, we know that they are the same with a whole bunch of caveats. So I know that's, that's really cool, and we have this way of measuring a color and objectively saying this is the response that a human visual system has to it. Um, but it's not really useful in a lot of day-to-day -day life. Um, if it were, we would be all of our color would be XYZ based. Um, humans want to talk about color in more interesting terms, like, is this the same hue? Is this the same saturation? Things like that. And so to get there, um, we have to do a couple of interesting transformations um, to do so. So on the left-hand side here, I have those XYZ functions. Oh, I was going to talk about XYZ a little bit more. Um, we had these RGB functions. Sorry, I'm jumping back here. Uh, we had those RGB functions uh, that we measured in a lab, and we came up with this nice uh, mathematical model uh, called XYZ. But in the lab, we had these monochromatic primaries, right? You remember we had this nice blue light, this nice green light, and this nice red light. And we couldn't mix other mon monochromatic sources. We needed some negative energy. How did we just fix that in XYZ? What did we do? And the answer is, the XYZ primaries, the, if you needed three lights, an X light and a Y light and a Z light, to mix together, together, it's true. You could find them, and any monochromatic light can be mixed with only positive amounts of these X, Y, and Z primaries. Um, unfortunately, you can't buy them in the store and stick in your monitors uh, because they are imaginary. Um, the trade-off here is that whereas these color matching functions, as we call them, are all positive. The actual lights that you would need to run this color matching experiment and measure X, Y, Z can't be formed because they have negative energy in them. Um, again, I didn't include the plots of those primaries because I couldn't find them in the public domain. Um, but you can find them, and they're very exciting looking. Um, you can actually see the spectral shapes that you would need to be able to do this. So now the spinning plot. If I take those X, Y, and Z, or we can still think of them as red, green, and blue responses um, of the human vision system, and instead of plotting them by wavelength along the x-axis, I can take each of them and I can plot them in 3D. And I get this really exciting sort of twirly shape. Um, and this is where you know that, that we're already screwed, because human vision sucks. Um, nothing works well. It's all sort of natural and organic. We like things to be on flat planes. Oh, we can stick a flat plane in there. Oh, no. This one spins, too. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to stop looking at it. What I can do is I can say, what if I wanted to, instead of talking about x, y, and z, which has brightness in it, and it has color in it, and everything, if I wanted to sort of form, as we talked about, these, these orthogonal axes, 
I can take that crazy, twirly 3D shape of every possible monochromatic light in XYZ, and I can project it onto a plane of equal value. This is the plane x equals y equals z equals 1, for those curious. It's just a plane 45 degrees uh, sort of to the origin. And uh, this is starting to look a little familiar to a couple of you, right? You see this fun little horseshoe shape filling in. Any of you have seen that before? A couple? Yeah, we, we use this a lot to talk about color, and for good reason, because we're able now to that axis x equals y equals z coming out of the origin is what contains our brightness information, or the, the overall energy in our source. And we can chop that off and, and sort of truncate that onto a plane, and we get this nice, easier-to-use shape in green. But it's still in three dimensions, right? I don't want to have to talk about a point on this 2D plane using x and y and z. So, this one spins too, guys, I can project it down, and I can just sort of forget about one of those dimensions, right? I can chop z out. And now, lying in this XYZ color space is a sort of subplane, that red plane down there. And so, basically, a point in this plane contains the color information of a source, but it doesn't have any of the brightness or lightness or energy of that source in it. And display people just go gaga over this. Being able to talk about color without needing to talk about the absolute brightness of their display is just a beautiful thing to be able to do. And so from there, we're now able to, in this diagram, I can still, that edge, if you remember, that came from all of my monochromatic lights. And I can plot that out step by step. Um, we're now looking at a projection of that red plane that you saw. And any point inside that horseshoe is a real color that you or I could see. Um, any point on the edge of that is one of our monochromatic lights. Uh, there's a little star there, because that's not true on that bottom horseshoe part. Um, and then any point outside that is, again, one of those imaginary colors. And so this is one of the primary ways that we can now take color and encode color and, and be able to communicate. I can measure something in my lab, and I can compute this coordinate in x, y. And I can send that across the seas to someone else, and they can measure something in their lab with equipment and compute an XY. And if we line up, we know that to the tolerances of our equipment, we really have the same color. Um, this sort of came out 1937-ish. I forget the exact year. I apologize. I think all of you work in different fields, and you realize that color is crazy and, and difficult and extremely hard to quantify. Um, we haven't even talked about perception. I think that's key. A point in here, and in you see these always drawn with a rainbow inside? That's completely false. A point in this diagram does not tell you if something is red or green or blue. It just refers to a unique color that a human could see. But that, that's sort of how we get from early days of color, not being able to measure every anything, through to what some of you probably know as a color space. I didn't talk anything about RGB. There's a lot of stuff, in fact, I didn't talk about. Um, from here, the world of color exploded, and people started researching in every possible direction, looking at how can we compare two colors and say how different these are. Are they the same? Are they just a little bit different? Um, finding color spaces that are more interesting from a theoretical point of view, looking at perceptual effects. How can we model the appearance of color? Um, we still don't know how this actually works on the neural level. We have a couple of good guesses, uh, but everything after V1 is sort of still a mystery. Uh, we don't know how any, uh, how any of that really works. You were asking earlier about something we call observer metamerism, which is the fact that the same color or the same stimulus can look different to two different observers. In fact, I can have two stimuli that to one observer look identical and to a different observer look different. And this is a, a, a horrible thing in the world of color. Uh, we didn't talk about color deficiency, color... I mean, th this list goes on and on and on and on. And all of this is fascinating and interesting, and I'm just not going to talk about it today. So without further ado, now that I've bored all of you, I'd love to take questions and go back and chat about the things that were confusing. <laughs> so you can actually... I don't recommend running this experiment. If you take a laser at about 730 nanometers, and you flash the human retina with a very, very bright laser at 730. And you have to tune it in so that you completely destroy sensitivity on those cones without permanently damaging your vision. 
you can actually temporarily completely suppress, um, you basically overload those cones and they can't see color anymore. And you can simulate all sorts of fun things like color blindness and um, you can actually go in then and once you've done this, you repeat our nice color matching experiment with people who are you are simulating color blindness in. And this is actually how we have a lot of data on the separation of those two cones without needing to go in and biopsy the retina. Um, we also like to stick, uh, well, we used to, we don't do it anymore. Um, a lot of our understanding of neural connections in the human, well, in the brain, came from um, anesthetizing cats and sticking electrodes into their brain and measuring as you put different things in their visual field what happens inside cat brains. So you name it, we've already done it in terms of sticking electricity in people. Yes, sir? When you have two observers with vastly different color sensitivities, these, these functions here, um, we end up with the problem where if I am, did Pixar make Shrek? No, who made Shrek? DreamWorks. So they synthesized the, the color green of Shrek and later realized that they can't actually print McDonald's toys in the correct shade because you can't manufacture it in plastic. Um, that's, that's sort of a off-the-cuff example of what can happen where I'm trying to make a plastic and I'm trying to make a paper that both look the same to you. And if you are a deviant observer, to me, they will look the same. We, that's the term we use. I'm not trying to insult you. <laughs> um, if to me, they will look identical, and to my friend, they will look identical, but to you, one could be reddish and the other could be bluish. And, or even if I want to take Mona Lisa and print a good reproduction on my wall, the inks used in Mona Lisa are different from the inks used in a printing press. And only for the observers that we've characterized this can we actually have the color match. And so if you deviate from the mean too much, you will have a different relative color perception of Mona Lisa than the average person. Um, no, so even though these two cones are very close together, um, the exciting part here is that the slope of this cone, see how the green cone has this really steep slope when the red cone is sort of flat and vice versa over here? What we get is we get a differential signal between these two cones. So there's actually a whole, inside your retina, there's a whole neural layer that takes these three signals and does a whole bunch of pre-processing to them. And there's some subtractions and some additions and um, that, that brings it down into sort of, maybe you've seen opponent color, like CBCR or something like that. Um, and that's actually sort of what enters the brain is this opponent color. Well, I should say there is a level of neural processing where there is a signal that looks like that. Whether that's what we perceive or not is always hard to answer. Um, but it's, it's because of the relative slopes here that you can still get good discrimination in that region. Uh, that's a relative sensitivity thing. In this picture, these three curves are normalized. Um, in real life, this S cone and this L cone uh, have much less absolute sensitivity. Um, and also, it's interesting that evolutionarily, that peak of wavelength that we can see very well lines up exactly with the maximum energy of the sun under about six feet of water. Um, so you can do with that information what you will, deciding what that means from an evolutionary perspective. Um, but we have adapted our, our absolute scale of sensitivity to color to some extent to the environment around us. The optic in the human eye is pretty crappy, especially around these blue wavelengths. And you have all sorts of fun haloing effects. There's this thing called the macula lutea, which filters out a lot of blue light. It's this like weird yellowish filter somewhere inside your eye. Um, and you get all sorts of diffraction and refraction effects, um, especially the, uh, the lens in your eye isn't very good from a wavelength perspective, and we just really aren't very well adapted to image blue light well. Uh, this sort of peak, well, our sensitivity is at about 555.4 nanometers, this very like mid-range spectrum, what you would think of as a very bright green color um, is sort of where we're adapted. One possible explanation to that, and in fact the reason it's used in night vision, that's a great point, is that because, as we talked about over here, we're more sensitive to green light than other colors, you need less total energy for the same perception of that green. So you can turn your monitor brightness down a little bit more at night um, with those green texts, and it doesn't feel quite so assaulting to the human visual system then. Um, we can also turn it way down with green night vision and try to make it so that you can't actually detect the energy coming out of the screen except when you're very close to it. So there are distinct color differences, um, physiological differences between different ethnicities that um, can actually be, be statistically significant. Um, another thing that that experiment did is here I said that that bipartite field just covered the center two degrees of the visual field. Um, and it actually turns out the retina is very different in those center two degrees than it is in the entire rest of the field of view.
um, you have a very different concentration of blue cones there, and you have a, a complete lack of, I crossed it out because I didn't want to talk about it, but these rods, which are your night vision uh, sensors. And so in 1964, they measured a 10 degree field instead to sort of include some of those other behaviors, as well as, a, as just a larger population to try and get more observer to observer variation. So darkroom red light is actually for a completely different reason. Um, and that was because Kodak realized humans need to be able to see while they're developing uh, film and paper. And so most uh, photographic like analog emulsions had no, just like our rods, had no sensitivity past a certain wavelength or with some advanced ones just had a notch cut out where those red lights are. And so there you're able to pick it up with your visual system, but your papers are insensitive to it. Um, so that's, that's less about keeping or destroying night vision and more about keeping and destroying your film and paper. I was chatting with someone about this right before. I was talking about dogs. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about dogs. Fido yeah, Fido TV, there you go. Dogs are actually all what we would call colorblind. They are completely missing the separation between M and L cones. And so whereas we have, hold on, let's scroll, work with me here. Whereas we have this two-dimensional chroma, they can only see a single line through this color space. And in fact, I'm lying because they don't even have the same X, Y, Z as us. They're all screwed up compared to our color. But no, your, your TV just looks like garbage to them. Um, they can discern the difference between colors, but they're not seeing the same thing as you. And in fact, the green grass on your TV that looks so green to the green grass outside your window probably looks completely different to a dog. Oh, um, the, the mantis shrimp is probably what you're thinking of. And whereas we have a three-dimensional model of color, the mantis shrimp has 12, 13 unique color sensors, and they, they can see all sorts of crap that we definitely can't. Um, uh, because we biopsy mantis shrimp eyes for science. <laughs> <laughs> Multispectral and, hyper and hyperspectral imaging is really exciting when you are trying to do machine vision, things like that, because you're not limited to what a human can see anymore. And you can just get a wealth of information about anything in the, in the world around you that we don't normally have access to. Um, for human vision, if you could build me a high sensitivity, multi or hyperspectral, if you give me 10 color channels instead of three or, or 50, and I don't have to take a sacrifice in image quality, I would be ecstatic because I could much better compute the actual spectra of different things my camera's looking at. And then I could come up with much, much, much better adaptation models than we have today for observer adaptation, white point display adaptation, all of this. We could revolutionize the entire color pipeline. Some women are evolving a gene where they get a fourth color channel. Um, and so <laughs> uh, it's a very small percentage of the population. Um, there's honestly no way to feed dimensions of color into the visual system that can't be captured by this 3D model. Um, so it would really have to be an evolutionary change in how the human eye works or replace the human eye with uh, something not human anymore. Those would really be the only options there. It's hard and it costs money and y you generally don't get it right the first time anyways. So um, I mean I can't tell you the number of times that someone goes out and buys a inexpensive consumer display calibration device, brings it home, sticks it on their monitor, uh, plugs in the software, they've just spent $200 on it, they run it, and the first thing they see is a monitor that looks worse than the monitor just did. And they'll just quit out of frustration right then and there and never consider it again. So um, display cal and, and imaging color cal in general is not a trivial field. Um, and Trying to bring that into the home, I think, is a problem that no one has really beautifully succeeded at yet. I, I think it's still a, a market share that could exist, uh, but we just haven't seen a, a masterful example of it yet. The amount of money a consumer would want to spend on a device does not give the device designer a lot of room to put in the quality of equipment that would be necessary to do the job right. Um, display Cal, you're generally working in relatively small deltas, um, and you're trying to measure it in a more or less uncontrolled environment by someone who doesn't know what they're doing. And so that's a hard pr number of problems to solve while trying to keep your cost at an absolute minimum. Um, if you're willing to go and spend $5,000 or even better, $25,000, I can get you a great display cal solution. But I don't know many consumers that are willing to do that. ASIS is a conversation we could spend hours talking about. ASIS is a new motion picture uh, color encoding and decoding and, and color transfer pipeline, which is trying to use a lot more of the underpinnings of color science to back it. Um, and we could talk for hours about ASIS, and, and Ali will be able to talk to you much better than me about ASIS.
um, we are still growing our ability to transfer and, dis and discuss color information. And I think that as more technologies like HDR hit the market, um, we've already seen that people are excited about 10-bit. They love talking about 10-bit now. Um, no one really knows outside of this room what that means, I think. But um, we're going to see not just 10-bit, and, and P3 is a word that's been thrown around. People like the idea of more colors. And we need to, as an industry, teach people that more colors doesn't mean better color. We need to be able to deliver more colors reliably. And to do that, I think, at some level, we're going to have to change the entire encoding and decoding flow of color. We're definitely not ready to do that yet as an industry. We're struggling as it is just to get Dolby Vision rolled out uh, in the home theater uh, industry. But hopefully we'll see some, some efforts there to, to really improve our ability to communicate color to a consumer's devices with them not knowing what we're doing. Um, that's really going to be the key there. Yeah.